We're going to start this lesson with a term that you heard in the last lesson, and that's allele frequencies. You hopefully remember them from the last lesson. They're a measure of how much the gene pool contains a particular allele or form of a gene. More specifically, you can calculate an allele frequency by taking the number of copies of a specific allele in the population and dividing it by the total number of alleles for the population. So from the last example, that would be 105 out of 200 for the big B or dominant B allele and 95 out of 200 for the recessive B allele. So if you solve that into a decimal, you would get 0.525 for the dominant allele and 0.475 for the recessive allele. So they are almost 50-50 in the population. And they should add up to 1 because they represent 100% of the population. And I'm picking up where we left off, but specifically with allele frequencies, because we're going to talk about Hardy-Weinberg, which is uh, involves equations that will help us predict genotype frequencies from allele frequencies. It's a model, so it does not necessarily, it, it's not, reality, but it is used to predict reality. So it's representing a population that is not evolving. And we know that populations evolve, allele frequencies change, but you can use it to help you track changes in allele frequencies and make predictions about future populations and their allele frequencies. You can kind of help it to make trends more obvious. So for a population to have no allele frequency change, which basically means they are not evolving at all, which does not happen, it has to meet a number of conditions. And if we haven't already talked about the condition, because you will see some familiar things on the list, we're going to discuss them in more detail later. But the five conditions that must be met for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to occur, meaning no change in allele frequencies, you, you can't have natural selection. So that means every genotype survives equally. So the frequencies don't change. You can't have something called sexual selection. So that means all the individuals are, ra are mating randomly. You can't have genetic drift. So you need really, really big populations, almost infinitely large populations. Again, not reality, but a good predictive tool. You can't have gene flow. That means no migration in or out of populations, and you cannot have mutations, which again, you know, good luck telling those DNA polymerases to stop making errors. They make errors. They do an outstanding job, but there will be mutations. But these are the conditions that must be met for no change in allele frequencies to occur. And so if you want to try to, you, you need to know this list. So I recommend using the uh, cap or the first letter here because they all start with no. Um, and you can create your own mnemonic device, make a sentence that spells out N-S-G-G-M. Um, I don't have any good ones for you. I, I encourage you to try to make your own. There's a couple equations involved in finding Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, so the first one's going to be familiar. We've already gone over it, actually. And so if we rename the two different alleles, the dominant and recessive alleles, P and Q, then you should know that P plus Q equals 1 because the sum of all the alleles in the population should add up to 100%. So there's a number of ways to kind of rationalize these equations to help you remember them, or you can, in this case, memorize them. But I want you to think about the heterozygous cross, the cross of two heterozygous parents. Um, the, or the probability of inheriting those two big Bs was 25%, um, but it's the odds of getting a large B allele from each parent. So that's going to be the frequency of the large B allele times itself. So P times P or P squared. The odds of getting a heterozygous, a big B and a little b, is going to be P times Q. But because that happens two times in that monohybrid cross with two heterozygous parents, 
then it's actually 2 times P times Q is your probability there. And for the recessive, it's again Q squared because it's the odds of getting two of those recessive alleles. So you can take all of these. You know, we're representing our homozygous dominant, our heterozygous, and our homozygous recessive. That should encompass all the individuals in the population. And so you can have that equal one. And you might be looking at this thinking, that seems familiar, and that's because it is a factored polynomial. And so if you were to take the sum of P plus Q squared, it would factor out to P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And so you could square both sides, and it's essentially the same equation. So we've just taken that P plus Q equals 1, and we've factored it out. And so now we're representing both the alleles and the genotypes. And generally, when people talk about the Hardy-Weinberg equation, this is the one they're talking about, but we're going to need the P plus Q equals 1 to help us solve problems as well. So now, if you were to have a Hardy-Weinberg question, you could plug in what you know and determine whatever you don't. So P is going to be allele 1's frequency, Q, and that's generally dominant. Q is going to be allele 2's frequency that's generally recessive. So you've got your probability of homozygous dominant, probability of heterozygous, and probability of homozygous recessive all represented. So you have both the genotypes represented and the allele frequencies represented. So again, why are we doing this? Why is this helpful? Well, it's going to help you predict allele frequencies but it also provides an expected number of individuals of each genotype under these, you know, very much impossible conditions. But um, those are all those conditions that ensure that evolution is not occurring. So it does help us to track that evolution is occurring. It's a handy way to track allele frequency changes. And we're going to try problems, Hardy-Weinberg problems, in class. And it's Q squared that's really, really essential here because that is actually r recessive genotypes are the same as the phenotype. You only show the trait if you have that genotype. And so that's going to be a handy tool when we start to solve problems.